Welcome to Compression, the quest to $100 million in just one year. Join me, your host, Logan Freeman, in this one-of-a-kind interactive podcast experience where I am on a quest to compress three years of achievement and production into 12 months. And no, the answer is not to just work harder. I'm bringing you not only ideas and concepts that are complete at the theoretical level, but they're also effective at the applied level. Look guys, knowledge is not power. It is potential power. Knowledge plus massive strategic action equals power. We're talking about strategy, systems, accountability, all in real time. This is Compression. Welcome back to another episode of the Compression Podcast. As you can see, I am back 100%. I'm not sure I ever dropped below, let's say, 80% in relation to the COVID, but my energy levels are, are back to normal. The kids are back at daycare, and we are back on a normal routine, which, you know, is exciting. But We're coming to you guys in the middle of the week this week, and since we just finished up February, we're jumping into March, the last month of this quarter. Can you believe that, man? First quarter already coming to a wrap. We're going to look back 30 days, look forward 30 days, and you guys are going to hear how I review my months and how I'm setting up my month ahead and setting some intention. So that's what we're going to get out of the the podcast episode today. Jerome, how are you doing, man? You got a big month coming up here, brother. Man, we got to close out the first quarter strong, Logan. We got to close it out strong. And I mean, we're not just going to kind of jog across the line. We're coming through on a full sprint, my friend. Yep. Full sprint. Full sprint, full speed ahead. You know, what I'll say is this is the first quarter. It's not about how you start the year, the day, the week, the month, the quarter. It's all about how you finish, okay? But you don't have to wait till Q4 to make the change that you want to have right now. Today can be that day. And so when we think about February, if you guys have been following along, February was a very introspective and interesting month not only for my family, my health, but also our business. And there were some great things that happened in February. And from a guy who got COVID and was quarantined for for more than two weeks, you probably wouldn't hear me saying, you know, or you wouldn't typically hear somebody say, man, it was a great month. But I'll tell you what, sometimes, especially with guys like me, it takes a massive event like COVID like your kids being at home, like all of these things to really open your eyes. And, you know, these events are happening in our lives all of the time. And so the takeaway from that is just be open to what is happening and what it means before you lose the opportunity to capitalize on it. And that's where luck is created. When opportunity meets preparation, that is when luck is created. Charlie Munger talks about this in Poor Charlie's Almanac. He said, you know, my whole career can be dis- distilled into having very specific mental models to make decisions. But when that opportunity comes, I pounce. And I don't just pounce. I go all in. And there's a word called all in. It's O-L-L-I-N. And I forget the exact meaning, but it means to move with great purpose and great passion. And uh, I don't want people to miss out on that opportunity to go all in. And um, I think I went all in in February. So anyways, where do you want to start, Jerome? Where do you want to start dissecting how February went first? Yeah, I mean, if you had to describe the month in one word, what's the one word you would use? I would say... Man, put me on the spot. I like it. So I would say this. It has to be implementation. It has to be, okay, all of the things that you were talking about in December, November, January, all of those things, it is time 
to implement. And if I had to add one other word into that, it'd be fluid. Implement and fluid. Those would be my two words for February, man. Okay. And so the reason why I asked that question is because when you have to pick one thing, it allows you to get to clarity. Yeah. Right? A lot of times we want to explain things and we use a bunch of words because we don't know precisely what we were trying to accomplish or what the outcome was. And so for you, 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 you said a couple of things already, and I don't even think we're 10 minutes in, but mm -hmm. you, you said, look, man, you don't have to wait until the fourth quarter to finish strong. The fact of the matter is whatever you're experiencing now happened sometime before that right. set you up for this. And it goes back to the systems and the habits that we've been talking about the past few weeks. And so your implementation word, I think, is absolutely in alignment with everything that we've been working through. Absolutely. Like you had the stuff that happened in the last, like, December, November, December, spilled over to January, February, created new stuff in January that showed up in February. And I mean, those are really short cycles in right. real estate. A lot of times we don't see stuff for three to six months, but you're seeing some stuff that's hitting in a really short cycle, which is great. And the implementation piece, the systems that you've been setting up, the systems that you've been implementing are the things that are going to allow you to be able to handle the pressure. Yes. You know, we're right on schedule. We're getting right on schedule from, a, you know, that on the hundred million dollar goal that we're pursuing. We're right on it, but I think it's going to accelerate. Yep. I, I'm calling it right. I'm calling it on March 3rd. I'm calling the hundred million is blown out of the water. I think it happens before the fourth quarter of 2021. And if you don't have the systems in place, you could get crushed. Right. But I think you're building the infrastructure and you see it, right? You, you see that there's some, some vulnerability there and that's yeah. why you're focused on it. And I think some of that even got exposed while you were in, through the COVID and some of the other stuff that's happened. And so putting all that together and focusing on implementation and operation is something that you don't hear about on podcasts, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody wants to give you the flash and dash, but the nuts and bolts, making the sausage is where the money is actually made. So that's exactly right. I, I love it, man. Yeah, I think you know, it's in the right spot. I've had uh, this week, I've had a bunch of investor calls again because they all got pushed and all that stuff. I'm working towards off offloading some of that, but the calls are going remarkably better because I just get started on a call and, you know, they don't hear the same things from from me that they are from other syndicators. And I think that is crucial to setting yourself apart, right? I had a call this morning at 8 a.m. with a guy who said, you're my 20th syndicator that I've had a call with. And I said, well, I'm not going to sound like any of those guys. And here's the reason why. And so I've been finding that unique voice that unique genius, our unique value proposition that is elevating us. And a part of it's because I have been elevating myself, right? But a, a part of it also is because of the authenticity coming from where I have confidence in our business. And that rings true to these investors. I also have been pushed by some great people in our community that we, we spend a lot of time with to really bolster up certain parts of our our company. And, you know, it only took 30 days, but that stuff is, is in place now. And the big piece that we've talked a lot about is the investor reporting. And, you know, that is, that is rocking and rolling and I feel great about it. And our investors are loving it. And that's going to be a huge, I think, opportunity for us to continue to, to, to even bring more capital into our project. So long story short, on that front, when you solve the inefficiencies in your business and you feel confident that those are taken care of, investors hear that. And uh, another guy jumped on a call with me yesterday and said, you know, I know I'm on your list. I'm never going to be a big spender. I said, stop right there. If I ever come off as looking at you as a person on my list, as a number that I can get capital off of, you need to get off. And I'm not, it's not going to feel the same way 
being on our list and in our investor club than it is with other people because I've built this business on relationships. I looked at all aspects of our business from operations to capital to deal flow to all of these things. And my reputation and my relationships were in every single one of those. And so this business is built on Parker, Corey, my relationships, and that's never going to change. So with that being said, there were some huge wins in February, not going to spend a ton of time on them. I definitely grew in my relationship with my Lord and Savior, Christ. And, you know, I'm I'm obviously a, a man of faith and I always talk about that. And that's that was a main focus for me, because when you lose control of a certain aspect in your life, you either find solace in a higher power or find solace in some other substance or somebody else. And I'm not telling you that you need to believe what I believe. I'm just saying, believe in what more of what you believe in. But on that front, man, I tell you what, being able to say, Hey, this is out of my control, you know, but I feel like I'm taken care of was a crucial factor. And I'm not a, I'm not a guy that's uh, easy to, to be humble in that scenario. I'm humble in a lot of different ways, but whenever I think about my, my faith, I could really grow in some, some humility But just sitting in silence, people might call it meditation. I call it prayer, whatever. I had to do a lot of that in February, and that was a huge win, man. That is what was able to help me stay, you know, constant throughout all of the challenges and the struggles that we had. The second win. That's the first time that's come up. Yeah. That's the first time that's come up. Yep. And, you know, you go to your quiet place and you go find your strengths and not a whole lot of people have the courage to admit that in a business setting. man. Yeah. Well, I think if anybody follows me and knows me, they're going to know that I wear my heart on my sleeve. And, you know, if you're hiding from something, then that is an insecurity that you have to deal with. And I have set out, to try to be as authentic. That was a word early on seven years ago that I read in a book. And I didn't even know what that meant in relation to to being a principle that you live by. But authenticity allows you to feel a certain way. Like if you never lie to somebody, you never have to worry about what you said. So the 75 podcasts that are out there, the 150 that I've done personally, Everything on those podcasts, I don't have to worry about because I'm just being authentic. And no matter what, I show up with my wife, with my children, with you, with the the podcast, that's how I'm going to be, you know? And so that gives you a lot of, I think, confidence when you're out there in the marketplace. And freedom. And freedom. Freedom. You you don't have to put the mask on. You know, this... This is a, probably a distraction in the episode, but I think it's pretty good. So I reached out to five or six people who I know are accredited investors and asked a simple question. I said, does the car and the clothes that a person drives and wears matter when they're making a decision on whether or not they're going to do business with the person? And every one of them, except for one, said absolutely. And it gave me pause. Sure. Because the people who are the wealthiest that I know, they don't spend any time on vehicles right. or clothing. Right. And so it's like, how do we get out of the space where we're putting on a presentation for people so that they may appreciate what we're doing? Sure. Or, we, we get past the look test. And you're somebody who puts a premium on the appearance of things, right? Yes. Your documents are second to none. Your website is phenomenal. If the hair is right, the sales right. Like That's all right. of those things are really high on the list for you. And I think you would agree with all the other accredited investors that I just talked to about, hey, how do I have to show up for this in order for me to be seen as, I don't know what the right word is there, credible is guess is the only word that I can think to put. And, you know, I, I sit here in contemplation on this particular point because to this authenticity point that you're speaking to, yep. 
if I'm showing up as my best self and you're actually getting to know me, then does any of this other stuff that I consider surface matter? You know, I think there's two sides of it, right? I mean, and you got to get a little more meta with the data, in my opinion, on that, because, you know, perception is reality in a lot of a lot of points. However, when you peel back the onion a little bit, I'm interested in the six behaviors that Robin Dreek is talking about. And investors need to be as well. But a piece of it is the method of delivery, right? A lot of investors do not have access to the syndicators that they are working with. What they see is a, a pro forma, an offering memorandum, a webinar, all of that stuff. That's not been my model. My model has been, you're going to get to know me first, and then you'll get to know Kansas City, and then you'll get to know the real estate deals and everything that we've got going on. But until you have a comfort level and trust with me, you're not investing with us. Without so, question. Yeah. Without question. They're, they're not going to invest. I'll let you finish your point. Then I'll throw out the joke that I've been using for the past couple of weeks because I think it's phenomenal. I think the, finish the point. The only point that I, I want to make sure I ring ring true is if you're not allowing people to get the same level of access to you, then your materials, your business needs to look a certain way. And first looks are very important. However, there's always that saying of there's never a second chance for a first impression, right? And that's why I focus so much on that. But Every investor that is invested with us also knows who I am as a person, right? And that's why on LinkedIn, you'll see, yeah, we put commercial real estate stuff up, but you've got compression. You want to learn about my life, just tune in. Everything is right there. You'll see stuff about being a better husband, a father, all of that. And I think we're in this space now where if you do not allow people into that, they feel like you're hiding something. And so absolutely, I think that's a big component of it as well. And so there's no question about that. They want access. You're a celebrity in a lot of ways, and they want access to the behind the scenes because that's what reality, reality TV has done for our society. Right. And so the joke that I've been throwing around is people are a whole lot more likely to leave their kid with you than they are $100,000. Mm-hmm. And I just let it sit. <laughs> I saw that post. I just let it sit and I, I let it cook and I let it simmer and they think about it and then they feel bad because you're trying to get a stranger. You're trying to get a stranger to give you money. They'd rather give you their kid. So how hard is what you're actually trying to do? And are you giving it the appropriate respect? Right. And if not, then you need to change your process because it's broken, brother. Right. And you're going to exactly. continue to fall on your face every time you go to raise money because you're not creating meaningful relationships. You're not showing people who you really are. And again, the level of trust that they have to have has to exceed them being willing to leave their kid with you. Yep. 100%, man. All right. Second win was, you know, I prioritize being a hero husband and a hero father. And I made Taylor feel special. I supported her many times throughout the day while she was working. I, I really unplugged and was with my kids quite a bit. And I let myself feel that was okay. And that was a big win for me because, you know, I looked at it. I said, I got two weeks, okay? I can make these two weeks miserable or I can make the best of these two weeks. And I decided to make the best of those two weeks. I wasn't 100% on it, but... I'd say I was probably nine out of 10. And, and I'm very proud of that. That was a huge win. And, you know, I, I grew closer to my children and my wife in this period of time, which, you know, I looked at Taylor yesterday and it was, you know, I had got back from a big walk and I was up taking a shower. I got out of the shower. She was up in the bathroom doing some something, I remember. And I just looked at her and said, is this real life? Like, is this what our lives look like now? Right? Like I should be extremely grateful. So this was a, uh, Trading my expectation for appreciation in practice was like this moment where my wife is at home. I'm at home. It is a Tuesday and it is two o'clock in the afternoon and we are together. That may not always be 
the truth. And if I really look back 15 months ago, that is not how life was. And so appreciating that, finding that silver lining was crucial for me. It was awesome. So yeah, the uh, third big win was dominated high value task. And this was a little counterintuitive because until last Friday, when I talked with Jerome, I, I wouldn't have written this down. Yeah. I I thought I was feeling, (laughs) and I look back, I look at what I set out to do. He goes, well, what's not getting done? Jerome said, what's not getting done, man. And, and uh, I looked at it, I said, everything's getting done. And so I dominated high value tasks the last two weeks. And it really gave me a big perspective shift, which I'll talk about in the lessons learned. The biggest loss, you know, being home with the children, trying to feed them all the time. I had a lot of temptation around food and drink and all that stuff. So I failed on on that a little bit, I would say. Just being more tempted, you you know, in scenarios that I, I I probably wouldn't have if they weren't around. And maybe I'm using them as a crutch because that's an excuse, but that, that was a loss for me. The second one was there was times where I let the circle of concern impact my circle of control. And it wasn't until I started to really get self-aware and, and go through the process of journaling and all of that, that, that I was made aware of that. And then, you know, the third loss, man, I mean, I'm just going to put it in, in there is you know, I got COVID and uh, threw everything for a loop a little bit. Depending on how you look at it, it could be a win or a loss. But like, I'm looking at it as a loss just because it, 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 you know, it impacted way more people than just me. And it could have been negative. It wasn't because we have a very strong family structure and I have a very supportive wife and I have the flexibility that I need to be able to continue to work and provide for the family because I'm building my business around my life, not my life around my business. But that was the three losses for February. I had to really scratch my head to try to find some of them, honestly. Well, yeah, the part, since we go through them weekly, it's pretty easy to go back and see what you thought. And then you get to decide what everything means for you. And I think you do a really good job of shaping that. And that's why COVID could go either way for you. The yes. belt on the diet, you mentioned, hey, these things might be excuses, but I think it really could just goes back to having this system. Yeah. Right? You, if you create an environment where you have to opt into That's the right. poor choices, then more than likely because humans are innately lazy, they're going to do what's most convenient for them in the majority of the cases you create an environment where it's likely for you to be successful. Yes. And right now you're not in that environment. The fact of the matter is little people like things that probably aren't great for you to eat. That's right. And some parents take a really hard stance and say, I'm not going to feed my kid that junk, et cetera. They give them carrot sticks and apple wedges instead of French fries. I get it, but man, do those French fries taste good. Yeah. <laughs> they taste so good. And so, you know, do we, do we want to make the, make it such that they don't enjoy them? I don't know. But, right. You know, if you set up the environment, if, you can't rely on willpower alone. That's right. the takeaway for this, right? Willpower can get you to a place, but you don't want to rely on willpower alone. And so how can we structure the environment in such a way that you're in a great position to be successful. That's right. right. You, if, you're, if your vice or your weakness is food, make sure your kitchen is set up with things that are good for you to eat. If your weakness is women or men, then make sure you're not in an environment where you end up in those situations. Right. Gambling, alcohol, whatever it is. Like if you're an alcoholic, you probably shouldn't be hanging out in a bar. Yep. You just acquiesce to the environment. And if you're Fear, weakness is mediocrity. Then stop hanging out with mediocre people. That's right, man. Right? Go get around some compressors and take that thing to the next level because you're just going to be uncomfortable doing the stuff that you would normally do yep. when you're in Rome, doing what the Romans do. So I don't don't write it off. Just say, hey, we're going to adjust the system. We're going to fix it so that I'm in the right environment. This is what I'm committed to. And this is what decisions we need to make in order to help me be successful with the thing I'm trying to accomplish. Yep. That's it. That's it. it. You know, this was very, this is a little story from this morning. I, I had to go fill the, the Tahoe up with some gas after I delivered food to the, to the food pantry. And 
Wait, wait, wait. That's that's got to be a win. You got it? You just got it. Oh, yeah. I got a Tahoe a while back. <laughs> yeah. No debt. You know, my buddy had a, he owns a dealership and and he's like, hey, I got a Tahoe. I was like, hey, will you take my Jaguar? And he said, yep. Went in. Got it done. Now. Uh, so we've had it for a couple months now, man. And I love it. It's my favorite car I've ever had. It's beautiful. It drives great. And it's got plenty of room for those kiddos. It's awesome, man. So. But the story was when I was at the gas station, I went inside and there was a guy with a shopping cart and he showed up and I looked up at the counter and shopping cart in the sense that that's where all his belongings were. And, you know, it was 830 in the morning. He's got a a handle of vodka, uh, you know, a, a two liter of Mountain Dew, five packs of cigarettes, He's pulling cash out of this metal like a uh, popcorn bin and I could tell he hadn't showered for, for months. And I I've been really focused on our family, helping people out. We do that on a regular basis. Like I mentioned with the food pantry and all that stuff, but like going out of our way, this is Lent for us Catholics where we're focused on prayer, fasting and almsgiving, almsgiving being helping people. And so I was going to, I was going to pay for this guy's anything that this guy wanted. And I looked up at the counter and he had that stuff. And uh, I didn't pay for it. And, and I gladly would have paid for anything that he needed. Uh, I would have said, hey, grab your shopping cart and go through the store, you know, like. But it just reminded me how important environment is. And, you know, he didn't have a mask on, nothing. I mean, I don't think he even I, it's just crazy. It was just such like a, a, a prime example, right, of like this opportunity for me to to remember how important environment and choices are. And, you know, everybody knows on this podcast, that I lost my father to drugs and alcohol addiction, which I just have a really hard time supporting any of that, even if I am helping somebody out. But that's all to say that, you know, I live in a little bit of a bubble, right? I mean, we're talking here on a video screen with lights and cameras and, and all of that fun stuff, but that's a choice. I never, I never make myself feel bad about positive choices that I'm continuing to make because in reality, there was a lot of things in my life that I could have chosen. And I did at some points in my life that would have led me down the same path that my father did. And so early on in my career, I would feel bad about not helping out more and feeling bad about where I'm at. But I go back to environment, relationships, decisions. And it was just a prime example of all of those things coming together and the compound effect not working in the right direction. And when I was pulling my pump out of the Tahoe, I looked over and this guy's got, you know, big old styrofoam cup dumping vodka in his cup at 830 in the morning. And I just, you know, it just gave me some pause, but it also gave me a realization that that stuff is still happening on a regular basis. So that's just a little side note story that I wanted to tell about how the compound effect can can be both awesome and really, really negative as well, if you're not watching it. So, you know, biggest lessons learned because I, I, we've gone off on a few tangents here that I think have been helpful. I want to make sure that people understand how I'm setting up my, my month. So I'll be quick on these because I've talked a little bit about each one. But the first one being this, man, when you invite God into your temptations is when you can beat sin. And if you don't, if you're not a faithful person, that's okay. Just think about it this way. When you invite affirmations into your temptations, that is when you can stay disciplined, right? You can say it however you want. But I realized for me, creating a new habit trigger around temptations. And, you know, I say a prayer whenever I get tempted on multiple different things, it triggers me to get out of that negative feedback loop and get back into a positive one. And between stimulus and a response is a choice, is a story. If you can control that story and that choice, you can start to really positively impact your life. So that was a huge lesson learned, just a one that I've preached on a lot, but also I was proud that I was able to actually implement that from reading you know, James Clear and, and all that stuff. So that's the first one. Second one is if you get the man right, you get the woman right, 
you get the world right. Like I think about what I'm doing in business, in the community, in my family. And I had a big struggle early on saying, man, you know, you got to be a Tony Robbins. You got to do all of these things. And that's not true. If you get yourself right, you start having positive impact on all the people that you touch. And it's the butterfly effect. It's that ripple effect. Drop the, the, the stone in the water and see those ripples go out. And I started to see a lot of ripples in February. People reached out to me saying, hey, I hope you're doing okay with COVID. And I just shot them a, and they saw that podcast that came out. They listened to it and they're like, wow, you're helping me understand that no matter what happens to me, I have a choice to make going forward. And that's that impact piece that is going to continue to ring true. So that's a big lesson learned. You get the man right, you get the world right. And where I heard that story was this guy was in his office, not you know, dissimilar to the one that I'm sitting in right now. He had a big project to work on and his kid came in with a puzzle. I started with the newspaper. He said, daddy, will you read this newspaper to me? And the kid was like, you know, the dad was like, no, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. So the dad took the newspaper, ripped it up, right? Ripped it all up and said, hey, if you can put this back together, I will read this newspaper to you. Well, what he, and the kid couldn't read. So the dad's like, that's never going to happen. He comes back in five minutes with the newspaper completely reconstructed. And on the back of the newspaper that he wanted to read, his dad to read to him was a picture of a man. And he said, that's when my whole life changed about impact. Because if you get the man right, you put the man right together, you can get the world right. And so I just love that story, right? It's just like, it's so paramount to, you know, you focus on you, then you start having impact on other people, man. Yeah, that was a big lesson learned this, this past quarter, or sorry, this past month. The last one that I'm going to say is just the new workflow, right? So like, I've touched on this a lot, but, you know, Jerome, you said that you've been in the cave and I believe that I have been to an extent and I've been in the cave, but I've also zoomed out a little bit and said, how can I stay more in the cave when I need to be? And it's completely per- changed my perspective on the new workflow that I'm going to create for myself and implement this month in relation to where I spend most of my time. So those were the three big lessons learned of February. It was an up and down crazy month, but I do believe that we made the best out of it. Without question, man. The thing that I was thinking while you were telling the story about getting a man right is just coming back to the red pill model. I always try to come back there and make sure I'm centered. And for me, when thinking through things it's always the self-image it's just promises that you're able to keep to yourself that allow you to go out and do the other things and so when that change starts happening within it radiates out and mm-hmm. it impacts everybody that touches you and then everybody who has that interaction exchange it goes to the next person and so for those folks who are seeking immortality which most philanthropists are that's how you do it yeah. Starts on the inside. You actually have to live it though. There's a lot of folks who just want the world to change and they're not actually locked in on themselves. They're not focused on who they are and what they're about. Right. Right. They they just do as I say, not as I do. But you actually have to live it. You have mm-hmm. to walk it. And you know, for those folks who are people of faith, you know, they they talk about letting your light shine, right? That's right. And actually being that. Right. So that other people will ask, hey, what's different about this person? That's exactly right. You want to look that up. We are coming in. We're already in March, coming up on the end of the first quarter. Just like I say on Finish Strong Fridays, it's the beginning of the last day of the hard, long work week. It's the same thing here, right? It's we're coming up on the last month of the first quarter of 2021. And so in March, every month, these are the things that I'm looking at. My major projects, major events, major deadlines, things that have to happen. They must happen this month. Best ways that I can prepare and show up to win. And the last one, I would feel like I'm living my best self if this month I blank. And then I fill all of these in 
on my journal. Okay, so I'm just going to walk people through these. I've got some major projects going on this month. First one being one that I can't tell anybody about yet. So I'll just tease that here. Maybe next month I'll actually be able to unveil a very big project that I'm working on that is taking on a lot of my time. However, the ones that I can share, right, is we've talked about the investor reporting. We've talked about the masterclass or the 10 critical growth factors of your portfolio, getting those initial calls off of my calendar and onto automation. We've got some projects coming up. We've, we're launching a new apartment investment opportunity next week. We've got active campaigns. So that's our email marketing and CRM where I need to implement lead scoring and tags and segmentation. And I need to implement the things that I'm learning in the Raise Masters Mastermind that I'm a part of. I got to get this camera set up. If everybody looks at Jerome's setup right now, man, he's got his Canon going. I've got mine sitting right here, but it's not on because I haven't figured it out yet. That's a major project for me this week is to or this month is to elevate my, my video game. And then re, this is probably one of the biggest ones, but I'm re-engineering scheduling. So I've been reading a lot about how to get things done, when to do things, batching, all of these different strategies to, to have the, the best workflow to stay in flow. And so I'm re-engineering this to, to get on Calendly and actually put different times where people can actually batch phone calls and in-person meetings. That I've, I've estimated will give me back probably 10 hours every single week trying to figure out when to do things. So that's a huge one for me, man. We've got some major events going on this month. I'm turning 31 on the 22nd. And I'm going to do that in Miami, Florida with my beautiful wife who has been trying on swimsuits for me and you guys will not get to see pictures of that, but I will. And so I'm very excited <laughs> about that. Going to Miami with her with no kids. We're closing on, we closed on 123 units yesterday. We close on 96 units today. We close on 12 units next week. We close on 48 units in April. So have all of those major events kind of going on this month. We're mo we moved to a new office and I have to get my workspace set up. I got to get my new Mac computer. I got to get my camera. I got to get my monitors all set up for success in that new workspace. So those are some, oh, and I have a big 12 month recap. So a lot of people have been asking for more access to, you know, the FTW executives. And so we're bringing a, a monthly webinar series to our investors and anybody who wants to be a part of that. And so we're doing a 12 month look back and looking forward also for this year. So we've got that webinar going on. So lots of major events that are happening this month. Major deadlines, I've got deal deadlines out the wazoo. I've got due diligence, I've got equity raises, I've got closings, I've got hiring that is happening all this month. So lots of deadlines that I am focused on for, for March as well. Things that must happen this month, right? I need to redo Calendly for those in-person meetings and for calls, eliminate the back and forth. I need to get my car licensed. I have to, that's been a whole process in and of itself. I got to go, vol I need to volunteer. I need to give some more time back. And I need to get started on my taxes. <laughs> Those are all things that must happen this month. Best ways that I can show up to win. You guys are going to hear a lot of the, the repeated strategies, but the morning routine, fear setting. We'll talk about that here in a second. Give my, myself permission to feel joy, knowing that the system is on. Trading my expectations for appreciations. Releasing tension, bringing the intention mastery instead of information overload. And I would feel like I'm living my best self. If I show up prepared, I work smarter, I manage my expectations with myself and with other people. And I'm a hero husband and a hero father, my man. So that's how I think about my months. I then reverse engineer the weeks to hit those monthly goals or strategies that I'm implementing on. And I revisit that page every single week when I'm doing my weekly recap to help keep me, like you said, 
centered. So that's how I set up my months. I don't get into too much more detail on it because I try to stay somewhat fluid because a lot of things move, they change, they do all these things. But those are the things that I know if I'm setting my days up that I need to be focused on. So there you go. There's the strategy. Was, man. was there anything in February that you wanted done that didn't get done that being moved into March? I would say, I would say that having the masterclass done, I would have ha- liked to have it all implemented on the recorded, the website done, all that automation completed. So that's bleeding over into this month. I have a call with the guy today to hopefully get, you know, that straightened out, but that's the main one that's kind of bleeding over into this month that has to get done. Well, I guess the last question, at least for me for right now is what do you think? Well, first of all, I, I'm, not, I'm not just going to let this ride. I was going to, but I'm not. <laughs> so there was a conversation we had probably four weeks ago. And you're like, man, I don't know if we're going to have much closing in March. Yep. And you just rattled off. I, I'm not really good at math, but something close to, to 350 doors right. this month and then another 48 the next month. So, I mean, all in, all in, it's like 400 doors. Yep. So what changed? Well, some of those projects that, you know, we're supposed to close in February moved over to just the actual closing dates being in, in March. But I think what changed was just a lot of action, not only, on the acquisition side, but also on the brokerage side. You know, a lot of people are resting on their laurels right now saying, hey, prices are too high, can't find deals, all of this stuff. My take on this is that Q2 is the time to fill the pipeline up as full as possible because in Q3 and Q4, there's going to be more buyers. It's going to be more competitive. If you're not laying the foundation now to get those deals done, they're not going to happen. And so... You know, it's just more of a not let up approach, I think. And so for for me, it was really thinking through the macro economic trends with the stock market, with vaccines, with the uh, new administration, with all of these different things that I see a perfect storm of even more capital flooding to the commercial real estate markets, which is going to make it more competitive to purchase and transact. And so I got to get ahead of that game. And so that's a piece of, you know, the the trend seeking that our investors get access to because I'm so involved in the market here in Kansas City. I can't speak to other places, but I got to imagine it's probably very similar. With that being said, you know, I have this this saying that I need to get into a, a picture or, a, you know, a, a sign on my wall, but it's, all gas, no break. Um, and they're like, when's the best time to fill the funnel? Right now. When, so I probably am on record back in Q1 saying, there is no better time to put deals in the pipeline than right now. It's probably Q4 of last year said the same thing. But Uncle G has taught me to keep that pipeline so robust, so thick that you don't have to worry about where the next deal's coming from and where brokers in particular but, but I'll, I'll say that this applies to syndicators too, people who are trying to buy deals. Their na- number one complaint always is deal flow. And I'm like, sorry, go figure it out. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm not giving you my secrets here in Kansas City. But for brokers in particular is that they focus so much on one or two projects that do not happen and they forget to continue to put new deals in the pipeline. If you're never worried about where that next deal is going to come from, you will not make bad or you will make better investment decisions. It's when you get hung up on one thing and you start to have cognitive biases in relation to loss aversion, in relation to the disposition effect, that you start to make irrational decisions and get yourself in a bad position. And I connect with a gentleman yesterday that mentioned he made a really bad decision during COVID and he lost six figures on that deal and a great deal of his net worth. And I have to believe, I didn't ask many follow-up questions because it was a first call, but I have to believe that some of that came from those cognitive biases that a lot of people get stuck into. And my my response to that is go get more, you know? And, and that's and that's not the right response for everybody. And but but this being in a position that I'm in and eating what you kill and hunting all the time is not 
everybody's, you know, calling, but I want more and I want the best. And the only way to do that is to go create it. You know, my best definition of sales, I'll steal from one of my old sales trainers, Jeff Beals, and he calls it manufacturing opportunity out of thin air. And I thought about like what we do as principals, as brokers, is you take a scenario where there's a property owner, there's a buyer, there's a there's a economy, there's all these things, and you create something based off of that. And you see threads that they cannot see. And if you're not elevating yourself enough to be able to see that on a regular basis, you won't succeed. And many brokers, many syndicators are just guys that are just taking what are, is given to them, what's easy. And, you know, unfortunately, that's not how you make a successful business and be, be successful in this industry. So that's what's changed, I think. I don't know if it actually changed or if it was just exacerbated from, you know, previous mental thinking. But, you know, the big piece of it is just all gas, no break. Now is the best time. They always say, this is a fun saying that I've heard a lot of people coin and re reiterate is the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The next best time is today, right? And so I'm just trying to plant. I'm just planting all over the, over the place. I've got other people harvesting. I've got other people cultivating. I've got other people making it into something beautiful, but I got to be planting all of the time. So I'm out there just sewing up the dirt, man, just sewing it up, getting my hands dirty. Got to cut my fingernails all the time, you know, all of that stuff, because I'm willing to get a little dirty and a little greasy to, to make it happen. Yes, sir. I think that's a great way to end the show, my friend. I do too. So let's end them with an awesome quote. And this is from the one, the only, the activist and the Indian leader, Mohandas Gandhi. And he said, satisfaction lies in the effort, not in the attainment. Full effort is full victory. So go out there and go get some this month. Thanks for being on with me today, Jerome. This was awesome. Thanks, Logan. Hey, Compressors. If something you heard struck you, made you feel a little bit uncomfortable, good. Head on over to compressionpodcast.com. And then you can also subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast at. If you feel inclined to, please leave us a review. It's obviously helpful. But instead, I'm going to call you out today. I'm going to call you out and make sure that you do your part sharing this message by sharing it with one person that might need to hear what we talked about today. Be great. Nothing else pays.